I would now like to introduce to you our last speaker for today, um, Shaw much awaited as well. Gul Panag, actor and entrepreneur, will be talking to us about her perspective on society in transition. A little bit about Gul. She is a highly respected actor and producer who has attained critical acclaim for each of her roles, winning awards, nominations, and adulations. In addition to this, she's also one of India's most powerful opinion makers and thought leaders. She's a frontline advocate and activist who regularly engages and facilitates dialogues and debates on critical issues of gender inequality and justice, farmer suicides, environmental issues, fundamental rights, secularism, corruption, and political accountability. An adventurist who loves the great outdoors, an accomplished off-road driver who enjoys living on the edge. A few of her passions include bungee jumping, whitewater rafting, rock climbing, and endurance trekking. An icon for women's fitness, Gul co-founded MobiFit, a technology company that makes fitness apps across multiple disciplines. She holds a master's degree in political science and is affiliated with the Amatmi Party. Please uh, give it up for Gul Panag. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Uh, I'm not sure if I'm worthy of it, but uh, thank you very much. Good evening, ladies, and the few gentlemen that I can see. It's lovely to be here. I'd like to thank uh, Embassy for inviting me here. I think conversations like these are really important, and we can never have enough of them. So thank you. Um, for women this year, in the Forbes 100 Most Influential Human Beings on Earth, 2016. For Indian women, Arundhati Bhattacharya, Kiran Mazumdar Shaw, Chanda Kochar, Shobna Bhartia. The medal hall at the Rio Olympics was exclusively dominated by women. The Indian team, women's cricket team, performed phenomenally over the last one year. Clearly, we are a society in transition, transitioning towards an India where we see greater inclusion and more participation of women in all walks of life. My name is Gul and I'm delighted to be here. Um, I've been given approximately 15, 20 minutes to speak. I'm going to try and stick to that. Um, and also like, um, I was enjoying the, the interaction before this, so I would, I would I'd be very happy if we could have a conversation and, um, and engage in a couple of question answers once I get done. And I'm actually going to share my, my thoughts, experiences, and my perceptions on where I feel the inclusion of women in India is heading. In India, we exist, and as I was talking to Mike about this a short while ago, over my second cup of tea, uh, which I admittedly required today, about how we in India live in multiple millennia. There's one India where we all sit empowered decision makers, choice makers, where we've had access to pretty much every kind of opportunity that the, the world has to offer. And it's a very, very, very lucky place to be in. And then there's that India, the India of, for example, a village called Mahadia, which is a district in Fatehgarh Sahib, which is my native place. Many years ago, on a visit home uh, to my village, I was astounded to find that the village that I belong to, uh, the district that it lies in, has the lowest sex ratio in India. And that was the district of Fatehgarh Saab, and that was uh, the census of 2001. That for me was an inflection point. I was shocked that here I was, a person living life on my own terms, from this very space, tracing my roots to this demographic, and yet, this was the very same district in India where we were killing baby girls before being born. I mean, I'm saying that loosely, but that's the only way you arrive at a negative sex ratio because you don't allow girls to be born. I'm not going to make the assumption that they kill them after they're born because I think that would be heinous. 
And I think that uh, really was a, was a turning point in my life. I realized that I was where I was because of the abundant opportunity I received and only because of accident of birth. Had I been born in a different household in that village, maybe I wouldn't be standing here. And that is what really, really got me thinking. Uh, and I think that's shaped the la a large part of what I've done over the last seven, eight, nine years. And I'm, I'm sure will, will be a defining factor moving forward. Going back to the multiple millenniums that we, we survive in, there's this India that, like we just uh, established, is probably at par with, with the best of the world in terms of the access to opportunity that women have, the wonderful women that are in this room today. Then there's the India of, of places like Punjab, Fatehgar Sahib. We no longer are the lowest sex ratio uh, district, fortunately or unfortunately. That dubious title now belongs to another district, as per uh, the last census. Then there is the India where women's rights are not even acknowledged, which probably give a great deal of competition to the kind of things that go on in the Middle East. So how does one define the position of women in a society that has so many verticals in which we live? Quite simply, if you take an anthropological approach to it, any change in society takes 45 years or three generations, one generation being roughly defined as 15 years. From the point of when awareness strikes to the time when you're actually able to bear the fruit of that change is three generations. So I'm assuming that all of us here are, are, are where we are because someone spent a lot of effort, time, and not to mention money to make sure we have access to those opportunities. And it's probably because that awareness was struck either in the generation that preceded us or in the generation that preceded them. In my case, I know it was my grandfather's generation because I am the third generation of my family tree to be reaping the benefits. And I'm going to talk about that a little while later. Which is why back on that fateful day when I learned about Fatehgarh Sahib having the lowest sex ratio, I decided to find found an NGO that I've now been running uh, for about Oh, eight years, I think, eight, eight, seven, eight years. And I called it the Colonel Shamshay Singh Foundation because I, I really look up to my grandfather. He was a man born in 1916, way ahead of his times because the upbringing he gave my parents and my father in particular is the reason that I'm standing here where I am. It's not really my father. Of course, I, I don't want to not give him credit for all I've achieved today, but he wouldn't be where he is because if his father hadn't thought way ahead of his times, way, way, way ahead of his times, so any change in society takes three generations. We are at a position in India where in some places that awareness isn't being acknowledged even. So what can we do about it? Well, for starters, more conversations. When you have more conversations, you at least acknowledge the existence of the need for change. If you don't have conversations like these, how do you even address the issue? So a lot of critics of such, not such, but the larger, uh, quote unquote, women empowerment drive, for want of a better word, that have come forward. You know, it, it comes forward and says things like, how will seminars like these help? How will conversations like these help? I think they do help. Because fundamentally, as per our DNA, women are meant to empower each other. Our our primal and basal instinct from, from the time when we were hunters and gatherers, from time when we were simians, is to empower other women. In a pride of lions, other lionesses will voluntarily take care of cubs of another lion. In a troop of monkeys, uh, child rearing is a shared responsibility. If the mother isn't available and somebody tries to attack a little monkey, other mothers will come and protect. I mean, of course, there are exceptions in, in, every, in, every, uh, in every such no, but by and large, women have always empowered each other across species. However, omnipresence the presence of patriarchy in our society tweaks that default setting to that of competition. And instead of empowering each other, particularly in workspaces, we tend to become fiercely competitive. Now, competition is great. I think it's, it's what is the hallmark of success. Without competition, there wouldn't be any success. But not at the cost of pulling other people down. And that's what patriarchy insidiously forces us to do. 
because you're supposed to nail that catch because nailing that catch and i'm putting it very very crudely is what your societal stature is linked to who you marry whether you produce a male heir is what power is derived from and unless we deconstruct those notions of power we can't proceed so how do people like us make a difference well very simply by making sure that we empower every woman we come in contact with and make sure that they can leapfrog the three generational journey because sometimes they could be the one catalyst of change that could give you that leapfrogging ability and 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 be able to push you across multiple years and beat the natural the natural progression of an idea being born i'll give you a small example um my husband is a pilot and he was operating uh, a flight from calcutta to bombay on route to kuwait and uh, very often you may have noticed those of you who pay attention to the stripes sometimes there are two four stripers operating so there would be two captains operating in the in the event of a shortage of a first officer uh, so both my husband and a very senior commander um, lady were, were operating and they were waiting for the aircraft to arrive so the excuse that is often made that the flight is delayed because of late arrival of the aircraft is sometimes valid so they were waiting in the in the waiting area where the passengers wait for the aircraft to come so that they could they could prepare it and then depart uh they were a, they were a, they were a group of about 15 20 women from a small town in Rajasthan who had never been on an aircraft before and they were curiously watching the aircraft coming in and parking and the aero bridge going um going to attach itself to it and they were taking pictures and they were fascinated and um they i mean you, my, my husband was able to tell from their from their fascination and their interaction that this was their very first time inside of an aircraft and it was their very first journey in fact they were so excited they come for a religious pilgrimage and they were going back so he walked up to them and said do you know what that plane is going to be flown by this lady <laughs> and i kid you not those women had tears of joy flowing down their cheeks because in that small action of just introducing them to who would be their pilot my husband inadvertently seeded idea in their minds that would not have probably reached in many 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 months maybe years to come they not only proceeded to take lots of pictures with uh with the, with the captain but they also gave her shagan money because they thought she was a representative of them all and she was living and doing all the things that they never thought was possible so they all gave her 100 rupees or 200 rupees or 500 rupees so for those of you here who don't understand indian custom we give money when we like you and when we want to give you good things uh it doesn't hold true when we're trying to buy your house because we'd rather not give you money then um that of course uh, that's that's not the right thing to be saying saying at a real estate developers uh, hosted talk but we love giving money in good moments like these and it's called shagun and they give and they were so happy these these groups of middle aged women at the possibility that sangeeta joshi in fact i know the lady she also was one of the stranded captains in brussels when the when the attack happened my husband was also part of uh, that unfortunate series of events so a uh, very senior commander i mean uh, almost 25 years of uh, seniority flying the airbus 330 250 million dollar aircraft but that that introduction meant the world for them that picture that those women the women went back with can you imagine the idea that's going to seed back in the town that they go back to that's how small stories carry forward and and become powerful messages as children we've heard stories our grandmothers have taught us india has had a had an informal a uh, formal manner of stories being passed on i'm sure the west did too but uh, we take those stories to heart in fact grandmothers would tell us stories like don't uh, don't put your shoes on the bed because snakes will come now obviously snakes don't come because they don't know you have shoes on you have shoes on the bed but it's just a way of trying to tell children to not come into the bed with shoes so lots and lots of these stories were crafted to pass on essential messages and that's also what essentially cinema is doing passing on messages um i'm often uh complimented by women for a film that i did called door and uh about how they not only enjoyed the film but what a powerful message of empowerment the film was 
and yet there was no male bashing there was no male hating and yet it was a, it was a film that was an incredible beacon of um, of of feminism and in 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 the act of entertaining the audience if it also helps you think if it helps you confront your own prejudices i think the film has done its job although it's not always essential that a film must convert or make you confront yourself from within or force you to change but when it does that it's it's always always a nice thing and so going forward we find that we're seeing increasing number of women in in cinema in front of the camera and behind of it participating in manners that were so far not visible to us you have lots of assistant directors or of directors uh, and telling perspectives of cinema that were yet untold and sometimes they draw their own bit of flack currently in the news is my friend alankrita shivastav's film lipstick under my burqa uh, and i quote the censor board the central board for film certification an archaic institution that continues to survive um, saying among other things it's very lady oriented it's all right to have had films that were gentleman oriented from the beginning of time but just because you have a film telling a perspective of a woman whether it's her sexuality or whatever it is it becomes controversial and rightly so because when women assert themselves to demand their equal share in society not because they're being anti men because they're just demanding everything that you already had access to um and i'm saying that pointedly while looking at the two gentlemen in the front seat but no of course no offense men you just happen to represent the male community um i'm 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 uh, i'm just i'm i'm not using mike for that example cuz he's a foreigner uh so he's immune and he he i'm assu- i'm assuming that he doesn't come with the kind of baggage that we assume indian men come with of course you don't come with any baggage i'm positive of that so um because social conservatism thrives on perpetuating what is already in fashion because upsetting the apple cart is always a problem from time immemorial whenever somebody has come forth and put an idea that wasn't uh, earlier existing it it's, it upsets the social conservatives and so anything which put forth an idea which was so far unexplored tends to become something which the conservatives will always resist the conservatives also let me remind you resisted the banning of sati and it was aggressive legislation that finally brought an end to that heinous practice so what am i trying to say here i'm trying to say here is that essentially cinema is going to be a mirror to society in the process of being that mirror to society if it's able to help us confront our prejudices and we all have prejudices and if we can act upon those prejudices and make sure that we create a more equal society in whatever way we can through initiating dialogue through maybe empowering somebody who maybe wasn't empowered maybe through a co we co worker coming and telling you you know i can't handle being the perfect mom and being the perfect professional i need a break and maybe you can be that support system on that one day when she really needs it rather than maybe just saying you know it happens to everyone i deal with it just deal with it so all of us have unique opportunities every day to empower each other and we must never lose an opportunity to do so another example of um of of cinema and its impact on the audio visual medium is um is how you can make a point without not necessarily being anti male when it comes to putting forth the message of equality i do a series for discovery network it's called off road with gul panag it fundamentally busts the notion that women can't drive uh which of course is a very very popular notion i'm sure all of us women in this room at, at some point of time or the other have been accused of driving like a woman uh so it, the premise of the first season of off road with gul panag where my friend and i go go and uh, take my customized suv and we navigate one of the hardest roads um built and navigate the highest passes um in the himalayas was that we can just do what we're doing and have fun uh we proved a point and we've done it again because we shot the second season we've just come back from the northeast but we did so without having to put men down which brings me to a very very important question uh and it's a it's perhaps an uncomfortable one for some but i'm going to put it out there nonetheless So uh how many of you think you are feminists? Okay. 
that's not very many women. So you don't believe in equal opportunity for women. Is that what it is? So let me let me let me come back to that in a second. Um, Kellyanne Conway, is that what her name is? The Trump yes. Trump lady. Yes. So she was uh, uh, speaking at a seminar. Uh, she said that you know I don't think I'm a traditional feminist because I don't support the idea of being anti-male. So in the, in the traditional definition of feminism, I don't really conform. To which the Webster Dictionary shot back and said, "We quote, Fem feminism is defined as." equal access to opportunity and rights. And each one of you who think they're not feminists are denying yourself that right to equality. So raise your hand with pride when somebody says, are you a feminist? Because being a feminist just means asking for the same rights that have long been the sole privilege of men. Don't feel shy when someone asks you, are you a feminist? I think men need to raise their hands as well and put those hands up and say that they are feminists because it's in the interests of men. And putting it very, very purely in economic terms, look at the increase in GDP alone if you had more female participation in the workforce. Look at the increase in overall productivity of, of the overall workforce of society if you had more women who felt that they should work. So. I, my aim is not to convert you and try to convince you that you're feminist, but you don't know it. You're, for those of you who haven't raised your hands, you actually are. And don't shy away from it because being feminist doesn't mean you're anti-male. I love males. Unfortunately, monogamy al allows me to only admit to loving one. So, you know, uh, let's not kid ourselves. There is a definition of feminism that has become misconstrued to represent being anti-male. And the reason for that is again the social conservatives. Because the social conservatives are the ones who didn't let you ban Sati, remember? We were burning women because we thought it was alright. Because we weren't feminists. It's okay to burn women, but never burn men. Think about these questions when you go to bed at night. The point, very simply put, is that we, unless we acknowledge that we need equal access to opportunity. I'm never going to get it if we feel shy in acknowledging that I have the same rights in society. I'm not trying to be equal to males. I don't want to fight a five set or tennis match. I'm not trying to assert physical strength comparisons here. I mean, if we could go down to that, the amount of pain a woman withstands during childbirth is what would kill a man. And that's scientifically proven. What is those units of pain? Dills, dulls, duels. So the amount of pain that a woman can withstand, if a man's put through it, he dies. So notions of physical comparisons are outdated. And that's not what we should demand equality on. When I say equality, I just mean equality of choice. We shouldn't have to choose arts or commerce because somebody has decided science is for boys. We shouldn't have to choose to ride a scooter which is gearless because Maybe changing gears is really hard because anybody who studied physics would know that the art is in momentum and once you've gained momentum, it doesn't really matter whether you're changing gears or not. But social conditioning allows us to think that we aren't capable of anything and that we're capable of less. Why, and that, that's the conditioning I'm talking about, that begins to upset the apple cart. When you challenge that conditioning, the apple cart is upset. The same apple cart that got upset when we asked them to stop burning women when their husbands died. Ultimately, legislation happened. But again, I'm giving a very, very extreme example to illustrate a point. There will always be resistance to any kind of change in society, including allowing the victims to think that change is bad for them. So, <coughs> largely, Sati was voluntary, let me remind you all and perpetuated by the victims themselves. The conditioning allowed was such that you need to kill yourself if your husband dies. You need to jump into the pyre because that's what you have to do. So it's important to question these conditionings, maybe not today. If you feel you don't want to question them, don't pass on these conditionings onto the next generation. Don't pass on this handicap to somebody else. Don't bring up your daughters by telling them the greatest day of your life is the day they get married. Do you bring up your sons by telling them that? then you're feminists. Or are you feminists? You're still grappling with that question. Do you, tell your, do, do you tell your son that the greatest role he's ever going to play is that of fatherhood? 
then why do you tell your daughter that the greatest role she's going to play is that of motherhood? Of course, uh, she has the unique ability to produce a child, but there's a lot more that she can do. She can be, uh, you know, kicking some real retail consumer ass as my friend here does, uh, at par, maybe doing things that Mike may be having a challenge to do with the way women and men come attacking you at odd hours for delivery dates and, and things like that. So, what I'm eventually trying to say is we allow conditioning to get the better of us. Wherever we can, we must always empower other women. We must question these things. And let's not pass these conditioning on to the next generation. I'm going to close with a personal example before I, uh, I throw uh, the floor open for an interactive session. So I got my, uh, my private pilot's license a couple of months ago. And it was a big bucket list item. I wanted to learn how to fly uh, as a hobby and uh, just like somebody wants to learn how to maybe play a guitar or something and I wanted to be a pilot. So I got my license and like everything that is the norm today, you eat, you put a picture on social media, you meet somebody, you put a picture on social media, somebody dies, you put a picture of them with you on social media, I was so sad they're dead. Somebody's birthday, you put a picture of them with you on social media. So I put a picture of me completing my uh, last check uh, as a pilot with my instructor. And then I went about packing my bags to go back to Bombay to pack my, uh, and catch my flight back home because my flying academy was about four hours from Bhopal. And then I had to catch my Bhopal to Bombay flight. So a bit of a rush. By the time I reached Bhopal and network was, uh, was intermittent along the way, I found several messages in my inbox, including my brother, who usually gives me alarming news. And this time he says, you're trending on the internet. So I said, okay. Uh, but I did not have, have the opportunity to go and look at what the trend was about. Later, I had uh, a couple of people call me up, you're trending on Facebook, you're trending on Twitter, you're trending on Google, what's going on? So I said, I have no idea. I mean, I really, normally, I usually get a feeling of a bad feeling before I'm about to trend. It's when I've made a political gaffe or I've uh, said something really outrageous and, you know, it, it causes a lot of backlash. So I really didn't know what it was about me mentioning that I'm, I'm done with my, my last check, that I, you know, I'm now going to submit a paper, I'm going to get my license. And you know what was the most humbling thing and actually overwhelming? That, that for me, what was just a personal achievement ended up becoming a source of immense inspiration to a lot of women. I, did, I personally didn't see it that way, which is why I was a bit overwhelmed. And I initially was a bit annoyed even because I had a really long day. I'd been up since four and I was getting all these calls from friends and you know some journalists who were saying, tell us how did it feel? And, and you know, um, it's because I think somewhere without trying to be that person, I ended up looking like someone who chased her dreams irrespective of the boundaries of society set on me. And, and that's what I'm, is, is, is the gist of what I'm trying to say. When I was very privileged to be born into a family because my father was born into a forward-thinking man's home, where I never had any kind of limit set on what I should do. I wasn't raised to believe the greatest day of your life is the day you're going to get married. The best you're going to look is the day you're going to get married. I look good every day for me, not for somebody else. And that's a realization we all need to have eventually. But I never had these limitations set forth on me. And therefore, I was never inhibited. Inside of my head, there's a voiceover. Voiceover is that, is that conversation that comes over a documentary when you can't see somebody speaking. It's a technical term. I, not sure how many of you are familiar with it, which tells me at all times, you can do anything, you can do anything, you can do anything. And I genuinely believe that. And sometimes I foolishly go on adventures thinking I can do that. And it's not just adventures. Sometimes you end up losing an election like that. But I would never have fought the election if I didn't think I could do it. If the societal thing was, you know, now you're 34, time you planned a child and all of that. If I started doing things based on other people's ideas of what I should be doing, I'd be a very unhappy person because I know what it's like to not be limited. And therefore, my submission at the end of it all is don't allow yourself to be bound by somebody else's idea of what you think you should be doing. Don't limit yourself. Don't sell yourself short. Because all of us have infinite potential and we must realize it. And as women, if there is something that sells us short, it's other people's conditioning of how we need to be. And don't let that happen to you. Don't let that happen to any other women that you come across. So 
I'm confident that when each of us walks out of this room, if we can just walk out with this message that every other woman that I come across, I'm going to do my bit to empower her, even if it means lending her a patient ear, because that's what nature wanted us to do. We weren't meant to compete. We were meant to empower each other. And if we embrace that thought, well, the day isn't far when the last woman on earth in India, Mike, will believe that she is an equal to her male counterpart. It may take 100 years, but it will happen. Thank you very much for being such a fantastic and patient audience. Um, I'd really, really be happy to, to have uh, questions, if any. And I can see one hand go up right in the back. I can hear you. Good evening. Hi, Ken. Irrespective, irrespective of the gender, is that whenever we are referring to somebody at, uh, in power or our bosses, for that matter, we say him. Correct. We do not say her. Yes. That's a basic thing in the psyche. Okay, when it comes to some place like the forces where it's predominantly a very male-dominated area and very few women there, I can understand it's a very practical thing which affects your psychology. Sure. But elsewhere, there are women who are doing a fantastic job Absolutely. and they are, I think, equal in number if you see, if you see the statistics. But again, whenever somebody is talking, somebody is referring, we say him. Well, um, uh, don't you think that needs to change? It, it that is changing. Yeah. A lot of responsible uh, writers today, when they refer to a second person uh, and a third person, they do so as she. Although that means you're swinging in the other end, uh, which also is avoidable. But uh, I mean, the ideal way to go forward in reference would be so and so person instead of him mm -hmm. or her. Um, but the root of that, of course, is, is patriarchy. Society has been patriarchal since the advent of private property. And while some society, some, I mean, when I say society as a whole, when we, when we went from hunter-gatherers to settlers, and when the concept of private property was introduced, that's how patriarchy began its, its, its journey. Um, and it has been challenged in, in modern society in some ways, not to say that there haven't been powerful women in history, there have been queens, there have been prime ministers, but those are exceptions. Are we truly um, a gender neutral society? Probably not. And again, when I say gender neutral, I mean from the perspective of access to opportunity. I'm not saying are men and women equal physically. That's not a battle we want to fight. And it's not a battle worth fighting because we're both unique. So because of the insidious nature of patriarchy, it creeps in everywhere. And sometimes it creeps in even in institutions. So society theoretically can be patriarchal. Um, the institutions shouldn't be. How do we correct that? Um, because I think even with now, awareness. if you try to change it, uh, even in English, correct English says that you're supposed to write her oblique his. Sure. But then, even if you try and change it, people kind of brush it aside. I think so what is it's going to take a while, uh, simply because, like I said, uh, the whole process of change is a very long process. From the time you begin to acknowledge the need for change, it takes, it takes three proper generations for it to actually happen. So I think it's going to take time, but it's these small uh, symptoms that ultimately outline the need for change and the fact that outlook is so dramatically one-sided. Because we are repeating it and it goes into the psyche. But it will. Cement but you see, in. women are also part of the messaging. So look at it. I mean, again, I'm going to make a slightly controversial statement here. A lot of us, without realizing it, end up grooving to music and singing along to songs that are deeply derogated to women. Whether it's Fiddy Scent from the West or Closer Home, Honey, um, Honey Sing. We, without realizing, are mouthing lyrics when, when you actually hear are probably not the most flattering things. Because we ourselves are so conditioned in the environment that we don't notice it. So um, maybe, you know, the point is that the gender neutrality in written, in written text will eventually come about. It will take time. But uh, it start, it's people like you who start it and then maybe uh, you know, somebody down the road won't even remember what it was like to not have him in conversation. So it'll, it'll, so. it'll happen, of course it'll happen, but naturally. Thank you. Uh, hi, Gul. Uh, one of the uh, two questions I have, one is uh, regarding feminism. I'm glad you spoke because uh, there is a general perception among all 
irrespective of the nations, that feminism is perceived as a, as a very negative term. So what is the reason behind this? Um, well, uh, okay, I'll, I'll, okay, just, all right. I'll go with the second question. So Indian cinema, uh, fortunately, they have produced such strong female characters in the movies. But in reality, I guess we hardly see any female leaders coming out of Bollywood or even in politics. Okay, so first question, uh, why is feminism a negative con um, uh, has, has a yeah. negative connotation? It's because what does being feminist mean? We've established it just means asking for equal access to opportunity and equal rights. Um, when you extrapolate that, it usually means that you don't put up with things that are unjust. So for instance, um, let's, let's, let's put that in the Indian context because that's the context we know better. Uh, suppose there is a man who beats his wife. Maybe, as per some conditioning, it's acceptable that, you know, he's my husband, he's my lord, and he can beat me. But tomorrow, when she becomes aware, she may not put up with that. I'm taking a very extreme example. Maybe he's physically abusive, maybe he's verbally abusive, maybe he's just not treating her well. So, when women become aware of their rights, they begin to stand up for these... Um, Injustices, for want, of a, uh, for want of a better word. And when they start doing that, the social fabric begins to get pulled. So the social conservatives would rather have an imperfect social fabric that's, that's, that's corroding deep inside, but as long as there is a veneer of everything's fine on top, which is why we don't speak about child sexual abuse, which is why we don't speak about marital rape, which is why the law has just stopped short of calling marital rape, rape. So... Uh, because it's assumed that if you're a husband, you have the right to force yourself on your wife. But if a wife is aware, she will speak up against it. So that upsets the social fabric. And that is the reason feminism is given a, a negative connotation. That when women get become aware of their rights, then they, uh, they start standing up. And when they start standing up, then bad things happen. So if bad things mean justice, then I'm sure uh, we know what, what side we want to be, be off on that, that line. So that, and that's universally the case. Wherever, uh, and again, I'm, I'm not going to go into religion specifically, wherever the sanctity of marriage is questioned through women asserting their equality in a marriage uh, is when religion is invoked and the duties of the wife are put forward. And that's how, and when that fabric begins to stretch is when you paint all of feminism with a red brush. I'm very happy if women say, we don't want bank accounts, we don't want anything, we don't want the right to vote. Because that's when you'd be saying you're not, you're not feminists. So it's very, very important when, when you subconsciously allow the perpetuation of messaging, which says, and even a man, when a man says, I mean, I know a lot of people who now openly say we're feminists. Men who say we're feminists, because it would lighten their own load. Right now, they're like that one beast of burden carrying the whole load. Imagine if somebody could share the load with them. And that's what it just means. An inclusive society means everybody gets to do their share of work. The second question. Um, I think there have been exceptions to the rule. Uh, you've had Jalalita, who was a, was a movie star. You've had uh, Jaya Prada. You've had, uh, well, I, I, I'm just giving you examples. You're entitled to your opinion. There's been Shabana Azmi. There's been, um, there's been Bangladesh Prime Minister. Look at all the beauty queens in South America. Let me not get started on the beauty queens. Because I'm one of them. So, um, I think to pick on cinema as, a, as an industry probably would be unfair. Let's just look at how many other industries have thrown up leaders. How many, how many has the business community thrown up a, a female leader? Has the, has the armed forces thrown up a female leader? My so question was that. Because we don't have, leaders will only come when you have enough cadre to begin with. You have to have enough women in the work, in the workforce across industries, cinema, the business world, retail, property, real estate, to then have to rise to leaders. You can't become a leader without entering the, the, the whole, without, you know, you don't become a general without enlist enlisting. We can't want to be generals without wanting to be officers and, you know, moving up the ranks first. So we need more participation of women in all walks of life to throw up leaders. Does every man become a leader? No. But some men become leaders. Most men become leaders because they're just simply more men in the workforce. When you begin to 
see more women across all sections of society, whether it's the armed forces, whether it's business, whether it's cinema, you will naturally find more women. The pyramid is equally steep for men and for women. I don't think people get to be where they get to be easily just because they're men. It's just that there are more men, it's a male-dominated field, so naturally a, sort of the, the progression is, is such that a man tends to rise to leadership position. But if there were more women, you would find more women leading 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 nations as well. So the need of the R is to assert your well, two parts. There needs to be aggressive intervention from the state. And when I say state, I mean the political state. I don't mean the state of Karnataka or the state of Punjab. I mean the state as an entity where you ensure equal participation of women. Um, the Prime Minister's very, very noble initiative, Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, there needs to be an initiative like that across the board for greater participation of women in all walks of life with that much money being spent, 0.5% of my service tax access, <laughs> which is going towards these campaigns. But that kind of effort needs to go and that kind of mass media needs to go behind. Today, so even if people don't buy into Swachh Bharat, everybody is aware of Swachh Bharat. You surely need to do that for 50% of the population. So I think unless and until this aggressive legislative intervention and policy intervention, we're not going to see greater participation of women in, in the workforce or in life. So ultimately it comes down to inclusivity, which is what all of us want here. Why be alone when you can share the load? I think this was also spoken by Indra Nui in one of her interviews where she said, women have the tendency of not calling out another woman when she's going wrong on a job. But what are your thoughts about men empowering men? You know, a lot of time men are mute when there is sexist remarks passed in a workforce. Against or women or against men? Against women, okay. against men. I mean, in, in, in terms of voicing opinions, it's like, chalta hai. Ye bhi chalta hai, wo bhi chalta hai. So isn't it, you made a valid point that we don't raise our children to say, or a boy child, saying your best day in your life is going to be a wedding day. And I'm a mother, I have a three-year-old son, and I consciously make an effort to say, no, women and you, are you, you have to treat your girl fr uh, classmate equally. And right. that's something that I'm trying to inculcate. But don't you think that this has also changed in a workforce, especially we're talking about leaders and leaders who can bring about a change. Why is that not? I think there's definitely intent there, but it's going to take a long time for change to be, ma to be manifest. I hope it won't take 45 years in the workforce because you're already dealing with aware people. And with the amount of, um, with the amount of fund allocation towards diversity and inclusion mandates that HRs today have, I think there is a, there is an, there's definitely affirmative action being, being carried out to achieve that aim. And I think, Men have to be part of the process because they are the ultimate gainers. I mean, like I again keep saying, why would you not, um, I mean, you know, again, coming back to a very, very typical Indian household example, I don't want my wife to work because her main duty is child rearing because I don't want to shoulder the duty of child rearing. That's where it comes down to. Now, why would you want to shoulder the entire financial burden of running your family when your wife is capable and interested and, and in agreement of doing so? Because conditioningly, you, don't, you haven't accepted your complete role as a father. Whereas, which would mean that you would have to make some lifestyle adjustments in order for you to both balance the parenting role. I'm giving a very small example. Um, so, I think there is, there is, there is an awareness. Uh, and, and sexist conversations, locker room talk. We made locker room guy a president. I mean, look at the kind of stuff that he said in the locker room and it was brushed off by women. A significant number of women voted for him as well. It's, it's the same kind of women who sing Firi Sang songs and Honey Sing songs. I'm guilty too. And I need to be constantly aware because even though I, I would like to consider myself somebody extremely evolved, my, I'm still a subject of the conditioning around my environment. I, I can't help, which is why when you said you, have a, you make a conscious effort to bring up your son a particular way because you're also a product of the conditioning. Sometimes we pass forward patriarchal overtures without realizing. And that's when we need to be so conscious of what we do. So, I think calling out whenever you get an opportunity, and you don't have to do it aggressively. I don't do it aggressively at all because I feel I don't want to make an enemy, I want to make a point. And I think whenever you hear something sexist, just be charming about it and call it out because that's what women can do. You can, you can use charm as a, as a weapon and still call it out. Not sure, I'm sure men are very charming as well. But um, they don't need to use all these weapons because uh, the war's already been won for them like 500 years back in terms of access to opportunity. So um, 
I think calling it out is very important and I personally never lose an opportunity to call it out. Never. Even at the cost of making people uncomfortable and I humbly apologize to any woman who felt cornered when I asked her if she was a feminist and she didn't raise her hand. Deep down she knows she's a feminist but she didn't raise her hand. I, I'm sorry if I made you feel uncomfortable but I never lose an opportunity. I wouldn't be doing my job as somebody who's an opinion maker, who's an, who's an influencer, which is the common word on social media these days. If I didn't call it out, if I didn't call out these prejudices, because they're important. So we can do it with fun, we can do it with humor, we can do it with charm, but we must always call it out. Because sometimes, don't blame the men, because they're also products of the same conditioning. I mean, sometimes my husband tells me, you shouldn't be going out late. So I'm like, why? Uh, b b because it's not safe. I said, okay, that's fine. So we'll work around the safety angle. But sometimes I think the conditioning that we are victims of is also the conditioning that men are victims of. Sometimes let's allow them that, that allowance. But yes, I think calling it out is very, very important. Never, ever, ever lose an opportunity to call it out. I'd like to think I've been very entertaining, but I know this is coming to an end. So we should, uh, I think, um, I think we should wrap this up. Uh, I'm happy to chat outside, but I think people need to get home as well. So thank you so much for being such a patient um, audience. I really, really enjoyed this talk. Thank you. Thank you very much.